Welcome to day six of Doc NYC. Are you ready for this? My name is Tom Powers. I'm the artistic director of the festival. Let me say some important thank yous to our leadership sponsor, HBO Documentary Films. And to our major sponsors, a &E, Indie Films, and Netflix, our supporting sponsors, Sundance Now, Doc Club, our leading media sponsors, New York Magazine and WNAT. And a really big thanks to the incredible Doc NYC staff and volunteers. Let's hear it for the volunteers. So uh, you are here for the world premiere of Mariela Castro's March, Cuba's LGBT. LGBT revolution. Uh, we couldn't be prouder to show this film. Uh, last week, last Thursday, uh, the very first day of the festival, we did this uh, lunch that's now become an annual event called the Visionaries Tribute. And, uh, and each year we give some uh, Lifetime Achievement Awards to uh, filmmakers who uh, have several decades of work, of documentary work that distinguishes them. Uh, and one of the three Lifetime Achievement Awards we gave uh, very deservedly last week was to the filmmaker you're going to meet today, John Alpert. Yay. You know, in, uh, in the New York City uh, filmmaking community, uh, John is not o known only for his great filmmaking, uh, uh, which includes you know, some really uh, hairy uh, reports from, uh, from uh, uh, front lines all over the world. Uh, but he's also known for, uh, as, as one of the co-founders of the incredible institution, downtown institution, DCTV, Downtown Community TV. <laughs> where uh, John tells me that, um, and I believe it because I've uh, met half of them, that he's, uh, uh, that 75,000 people have passed through DCTV. Am I right with that figure? 75,000 people have passed through uh, uh, getting trained um, at, uh, at DCTV. Raise your hand if you have a DCTV connection, if you've ever uh, benefited from DCTV. Yeah, well, we could fill many theaters of, uh, of people raising their hands because uh, it's such a beloved institution. So, uh, extraordinary figure. We're so happy to have him with us uh, here tonight. Uh, and so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to watch Mariela Castro's um, uh, uh, Last March. And um, or Mary Ella Castro's March. It's not a last March. She's got lots of marches. Um, uh, and uh, and then uh, afterwards, we're going to uh, be joined for a conversation with John Alpert and Sheila Evans, the head of HBO Documentary Films, <laughs> who uh, so many uh, filmmakers uh, owe a debt of gratitude for her longtime support of documentary films, myself included, when I made documentary films. Uh, Sheila uh, acquired my first film. Um, and uh, so it's going to be a lively conversation. We're going to talk about this film, and we're going to talk about the long collaboration between uh, Sheila Evans and John Alpert. Um, before I uh, bring up our guest, I want to acknowledge a, uh, another distinguished uh, guest in the audience uh, talking about um, the crusade for LGBT rights. He was the subject of a documentary on HBO. Uh, please uh, give a nod to Larry Kramer in the audience. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to bring up uh, the director. Please welcome John Alpert. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody from Doc NYC. Thank you, everybody from HBO. Um, you know, once you all know what's happened to the price of taxi medallions now that Uber's come out and they've devalued. So once I got that award, <laughs> I'm, I'm really I have to apologize to the previous recipients, but thank you anyway. Uh, tonight, um, this is a film that uh, we worked on for three years. Um, Cuban Revolution uh, was something that set a fire in a lot of us. Um, I know as a, as a young kid, I went down to Cuba because I was so excited about what they were doing with health care, what they were doing with housing, uh, what they were doing in many civil rights. Um, at the time, I was unaware 
of what they weren't doing with gay rights. And um, the revolution, in fact, for all its accomplishments, was extraordinarily homophobic. Um, gay men were rounded up and put in work camps. Uh, and this is a film about the fight to rectify that legacy and to have equal rights uh, in Cuba. So I hope you like it. Uh, we're going to show it in Havana next month. Uh, we have about 10 people in the audience who are going. Um, I think that's going to be pretty cool, but I'm curious uh, for your reaction to that as well. So thank you. So <laughs> we're going to watch the film. It's about a little over a half hour long, and then we'll be back here for a conversation. Here is Mariela Castro's March. John Elpert and Sheila Evans. Uh, so, John, I want to talk a little bit about this film, and then I want to talk about uh, your your long career uh, collaborating with with Sheila on projects at HBO. But let's start with uh, Mariela Castro's March. You described in the beginning that, you, uh, as a young man, you had been uh, very inspired by the Cuban Revolution. You hadn't really um, put together uh, what had been the the situation for LGBT people in Cuba. And so, w w you know, when did you get the idea to make this film and, and wh where'd you go from there? Uh, so this is one of the few films that's not Sheila's idea originally. Almost all of the good ones are. Uh, and John, that's so sweet. Isn't it nice? And, yeah, and you know, talking about my long career, it'd be really sh short uh, if, if it wasn't for Sheila. Oh, uh, please. I still have my taxi driver's license. You do? Yeah. You may need it again. I, 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 quite possibly. <laughs> Uh, so the film is Saul Landau's idea. Who knows who Saul Landau is? I heard a nice clap. Okay. So we all love Saul Landau. Saul Landau went down to Cuba in 1959 or 1960, right at the beginning of the revolution. Uh, and he made some extraordinary films down there. His film Fidel is one of the classics in terms of looking at a revolution uh, and also uh, understanding Fidel. And Saul came to me and he said, John, there's one last film I want to make. I want to make it about Mariella and the LGBT revolution. I'm getting old. Can you help me? And I didn't know that uh, Saul was dying. And so Saul died um, basically three months into the film. And I went to see him on his deathbed and told him how inspired I was by the work that Mariella was doing and the fight that people were undertaking for their own rights and promised him I would do my best to finish the film. Um, uh, Sheila, you would mentioned to me earlier, when you first heard the idea of this film, you were skeptical. No, no, I thought it, uh, there was enough going on here and I, John wanted to do it and he did it and I didn't support it. I thought, great, let him make it. And then, um, what happened? You showed it to me, right? Okay, here's a trick, okay? <laughs> Don't tell Will you cover your ears? Cover your ears, okay, <laughs> Sheila. But I can still hear John. Oh, even so Sheila, she, Sheila began asking. There was a little bit of a buzz, uh, especially within HBO. Um, um, there are some really wonderful people who work with Sheila, and I showed them the film. And, That's uh, not accurate. Sheila. And Sheila began asking to see it. And began asking? Began I don't begin. Asking, I asked. And I didn't show it to her, <laughs> okay? And uh, it was about the, the fourth or fifth time. It, we kept on editing it. Dave Manessis is here, uh, edited this film. Uh, you want to stand up, David? Okay. Come on. Thank you. John Custodio is here, helped finish editing the film. Where are you, John Custodio? Okay. Um, and uh, um, Sheila really wanted to see the film. Um, and she saw it. And then one day I was, I was down in North Carolina, it was 120 degrees, I was filming something that I see Sheila's calling and I'm really scared because I know she's been looking at the film and I don't know what the answer is. I love it! She well, said it was great. That's a it, horrible it imitation great. of oh, Sorry, how, how did you say it? I said I love this film, yeah, it's great so John, I was wrong. And, and, and I, well, what did you say? I said, I love this film. It was great. She didn't say she was I, wrong. I did you hear her say she was wrong? Well, I didn't hear What was I the last three words? <laughs> I said, I was wrong. I didn't think there was anything there. You made a great film. Why don't you give me credit for saying that? I did. And, and, and it was wonderful. But the uh, way you did are, it. That's music. I did yeah, yeah. Like that. I don't talk like that. <laughs> I'm never going to make another film again. <laughs> so. Um, I want to ask you about this film. You know, all good documentaries, I think, 
raise as many questions as, uh, as they answer, and, and this film certainly does that. Um, uh, first of all, talk about what it's like being uh, an American filmmaker in, in Cuba now, or, or during the time of making this film. How, what is your, what is it like to navigate there? So things have really changed. Uh, the first time we went to Cuba, they were very nervous. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, they sort of locked us up in a remote camp and never came to get us. And I... Uh, the first time in the course of making this film? No, no, the first There's, time historically. Historically, yeah. which would have been when? This would have been, well, the first time they wouldn't even let us get off the boat. That was 1972. They locked us up on the boat for, for three days. Uh, then they locked us up in a camp uh, two years later. Uh, and only when I... Uh, so at least you least you moved strike. to land by that point. Yeah. I went on strike. Uh, and, and they let us make a film. Very, very primitive in terms of documentaries, but our first documentary. Um, we, we always had a babysitter with us. Um, everything had to be requested in writing. It was really hard to make films in Cuba. Uh, now anybody can go. Um, and um, there are so many wonderful films waiting to be made. Uh, the sort of conflict between what's been going on there for years. Um, everybody who's going to go with us in December is going to have a wonderful time. Cuba is a fascinating place. So, uh, in, in this film, Mariela Castro, uh, daughter of Raul Castro, niece of Fidel, is established in the film. Uh, you, you never, at least in the film, kind of ask her directly um, how her uh, views on, on LGBT rights square with the, the official regime uh, led by her father and, uh, and, and uncle. Um, Fidel has officially apologized for their homophobic policies. Raul hasn't done that in public. He's told Marielle in private that he's proud of what she's doing, that she's moving too fast, but he's supporting her. And um, so uh, talk to us about you know, anything you experienced kind of outside the frame of, uh, of what we saw when you're, when you're traveling these places uh, that you know, seem like they have a long way to go uh, towards acceptance. Um, there are still some people who are afraid to come out. Um, there's a 85-year-old grandmother uh, who has been gay all her life, forced to get married by her parents. They threatened to kill her. Um, and she's still hiding this in public. Uh, so it, it's not working for everybody, but it's working for a lot of people. Uh, that's a really macho society. Uh, the Catholic Church is against what Mariel is doing. Uh, but the dial's been moved. So, Sheila, when you watched this film, what were the things that you responded to in it? Um, I thought that the way we had approached the fight for gay rights in this country had been very middle class, that those seemed to be the spokespeople. And when I saw this film, I was really surprised by the, I don't know, I said to Sarah Bernstein, you know, I, I believe these people so deeply. They didn't go to Harvard, they didn't go to Yale. They are country people for whom the regular choice would be so simple, and yet it is so basic to who they are. And I thought that John did what he does so incredibly well, which is he finds anonymity. He doesn't find people with a program. I'm just saying something nice about you That's once, nice just one time, just one time. Um, but what John has taught me. Is anybody recording this? <laughs> John, I say the same thing all the time. There's no need to record. The thing was that, that what John did here and what embarrassed me because I didn't really think this film would be anything, frankly, and I was wrong, was that he got the essence of difference without any agenda. These people simply wanted to live their lives, whether they were you know, feeding pigs. They weren't graduates of anything other than life itself. And I thought it was a very moving look at being who you are. And I think Mariella, I mean, I finally met her when, during the UN, but I mean, I just fell so madly in love with her. I thought she was so extraordinary to take this stand in this country. And of course, I'd been to Cuba before, and I was kind of excited by the revolution. I thought it was interesting. Everybody, kids were wearing uniforms, going to school. The, the cost, of, it was just interesting in, in a sort of, cerebral way, but I didn't really ever go into the countryside and do anything really extraordinary like John did. But um, what was the question? 
what you responded to in this film, which I think... I responded to the earthiness of this film. And I don't know any film in this country about this issue that is so down home. And I felt at home in Cuba and at home with this film. And I, I thought John did a fabulous job. I really did. I really did. This, so, one, this one time. <laughs> so shall I pitch you in my next film about Cuba? You want to you watch something no, really I interesting? No, I don't want to. Okay, watch. So all you filmmakers, okay... You, you're, yeah. you're, you're always looking for this little crack in the door, and you think that Sheila is finally like very open to what you're going to do. So our chef d'oeuvre, what's that mean in French? Chez what? Chez d'oeuvre. The, the, your work. Your our, chief our chief work, work the, the, the work of, of, of the culmination of all these years of documentary making. I've been following three Cuban families since 1972. I met one little girl on the street, another guy's a street criminal. Uh, and three peasants. John, are you pitching the entire audience? I'm just, we're, we're, we're showing the, the process. I mean, oh. this is this what Doc NYC is about. Hurry, and, because and I'm falling asleep. Oh, okay, so this is the roller coaster and the actual life of the Cuban Revolution. I think she seen, needs to see some footage. Seen, th <laughs> <Thank> seen, you, <laughs> seen through the eyes of these three families. Do you see what my job is? Do you see what I go through? Let me uh, get some perspective on how long the, the two of you have been working together. John, what was your first film uh, with, for Sheila? Seems like only yesterday uh, that Sheila broadcast Life of Crime. So Life of Crime is the sort of precursor to cops, except it's not with the cops, it's with the criminals. And we basically rode on the shoulders of three criminals from Newark, New Jersey. Um, Sheila actually became so... And what year was that? Long, 80, 80. long time ago. Long time ago. It's a long time ago, uh, and that was our first documentary. I th think that's sort of a, a quintessential America undercover documentary, wouldn't you say? I thought it was a great documentary, yeah. except when you brought them to HBO for the screening. Who? Did I brought? Uh, did I bring anybody to HBO? Yes, you did. Yeah. Yeah. Never mind. Okay. Right. <laughs> so that that was one year in the life of crime, and where were you at, in, in your career at that point? I was um, down lower than the curb. Um, I had had um, I, some, some nice rides. Uh, we made documentaries for PBS, and then we were blacklisted by PBS for a documentary we made about health care. Be careful when you make documentaries about health care. Health care and Israel-Palestine are the two things that you can't win, and, and we got blacklisted for that. Um, got blacklisted by NBC and all commercial television for our report from Iraq during the first Gulf War. We just really got slammed. Um, and I was flatter than a pancake and Sheila scraped me off the ground. Oh, and, <laughs> and, and give us a, like how many projects have you done for HBO over the years? Lots and lots and lots. We've had like three on this week. Uh, was someone on last night? Anybody watch the Latin Explosion? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, in general, in the beginning, it was, it, it was all pretty down and dirty. Uh, Life of Crime One, Life of Crime Two, High on Crack Street, which we showed here in the festival. I hadn't seen that film in in 20 years and got high watching all these people smoking crack. I don't know how we were able to film it. Uh, the most fun we ever had was the Cinderella season in which we followed oh, the University of Tennessee women's basketball team for a year and they miraculously won the championship. But the film that uh, I'm most appreciative for Sheila letting us do was the documentary I made about my father called Papa. Well, that was great, John. What about Salsa? Salsa was fun, but I still, I still can't dance. We did one about uh, John, it salsa wasn't about dancing. you. It was about other people. <laughs> we filmmakers get the things backwards every once in a while. So I will say one. Can I say something about John? Because I don't usually compliment him. We're usually arguing about something. Um, John takes the... There's so much fame and celebrity in the docu, in docu land where everybody approaches you know, a name because it's such a crowded market and it's so very hard to sell a project. So you'll notice that there are names. Nothing wrong with doing wonderful documentaries about wonderful people. But John manages to go to what we would consider anonymous people and tell their story in such a theatrical and heightened way that we feel a kinship with people who are not on the screen every day or on television every day, but people who are just like ourselves, but who are um, regular folk. And I think that talent that he has, which why would I ever want to work with him on so many films if he didn't have this extraordinary ability to get 
the baker and the butcher and the candlestick maker to spill their hearts out because they trust him. And that's a, an enormous talent. Plus, he's a wonderful cinematographer. And I think that combination, I mean, he makes the film, he crafts it. It's like the, the silver putty in his hands. But there's nothing aristocratic about John. But you went to very good schools, didn't you, John? Didn't you go to Princeton or something? No. Where did you go? I went to Princeton. I went to Colgate and uh, well, never That's pretty good. No, I wanted to be a hockey player. And uh, He's just like a regular guy. Like he has a motor scooter or whatever you call it. He goes into construction sites and breaks ribs. I mean, he's always in the hospital with some broken bone, that's, right? That's true. I did uh, two ribs this year. What's that on your foot? It's my wallet, Sheila. On your foot? Hey, look how big it is. It's actually just uh, full of the Mostly receipts Mostly HBO's of the bills. money, the I bills, might add. The yeah. bills that I had to pay. <laughs> Or it's a prison bracelet. But that's the that's good it. part of John. He is persistent. He is incredibly, um, I, I can't explain it. I'm not a brave person. I, I like to watch his bravery. Tough. I am extremely tough, but I always have a life jacket on. John goes without a life jacket everywhere. He likes crisis, he, crises. He likes to land in war zones. Nothing intimidates him. I had to get you out of jail in China. Did what about Sichuan? Did. I called you, right? And aren't you sorry about that? You know, because I know there was a debate, right, Peter? She was like debating whether Peter. she should try to get us out of jail or not. No, right? no, no, Peter. I said try to get him out of jail. And she says, "Am I going to have to? <laughs> am I going to have to pay for the bullet?" Right? No, right? no, no. It was a Sunday, and they called and they said John is in a shopping mall arrested That's with true. Matt. Right? They, we we, got they snuck into Setuan. We did the the. Would you tell that story? That's a great film, John. Only you could have made that film. Yeah, but remember, I tried to, I, I, I thought we had failed and we got there too late, and I called Sheila and said, listen, we're wasting our money. But the next day we met all the parents whose kids had been killed in the earthquake because the government officials had stolen the money to build the schools, and they made the schools out of cardboard, and the kids all died in the earthquake. And they moved the kids from, they were in a, what was now a bank, which didn't get co collapsed during the earthquake. They moved all these kids into this into cardboard stru structure. Yeah, so they could make money out of the good structures. And, and um, we got jumped by 35 secret police in a shopping mall as we were buying gifts to bring back to, to Sheila. John buys arrested. very good gifts, right. by the way. We were, we were, we were shopping for our, all our friends at HBO when we got arrested. Um, did we get him out, get Peter? Out do, how do we get him out, Peter? What do we do? I think I fell asleep. You know that great Woody Allen thing where he says, I was kidnapped, my parents led, read the kidnap letter, but they fell asleep <laughs> while they were reading it. But anyway, Peter, we got him out. How? I believe he talked his way. Talk, yeah, uh, we we knew we knew that we were in trouble. Um, the the chief cop uh, basically said, "Next time I see you, um, I'm only going to have one thing to say to you: you're under arrest." Yeah, but you didn't go home. You kept shooting. Kept shooting. But we would wake up at three o'clock in the morning. True. These were civil servants, and so by the time they were up, we were already back in the hotel. And once we got enough critical mass, um, my nephew was, uh, st was studying medicine in southern China, and I called him up. Um, and I said, um, where are you? And he says, I'm actually in Shanghai. I'm going home tomorrow. And I said, don't move until you meet a friend of mine. They're going to hand you a package. Don't ask any questions. Take it out of the country. <laughs> And so as they were grilling us in the police station and asking for our tapes, I said, gee, I'd, lo you know, I'd love to turn the tapes over, but they're back in New York, and no matter what you do to us, you can't stop the story. I think that's when we figured we didn't need you to come back. We had the they, tapes. They had right? the tapes. <laughs> yeah, they, they did have the tapes. Yeah. So, uh, John, let me ask you one more question. Then we've got a reception that we can all go to and, and keep this conversation going uh, over sponsored drinks. Um, uh, John, what is it that, that, that drives you? I mean, you've made films, as, as Sheila described, in, uh, in frontline territories and, uh, you know, all kinds of foreign countries. Uh, uh, you know, often, at, uh, as, as Sheila described, are people who are uh, often overlooked by the media. Uh, what is it that, that motivates you? Uh, initial total failure. Uh, when we were youngsters, we were all involved in different forms of, of community activism, trying to get better schools, trying to get better hospitals. I was a taxi driver trying to get better working conditions, and everything we did failed. Uh, one day I made a, a film about my fellow taxi drivers, and I showed it at our union meeting right around the corner. 
um, at the church we used to call the Gay Church on Ninth Avenue. And it was like waving a magic wand over all these raucous cab drivers. And all of a sudden, they all united. Uh, we took basically over all the shops in Manhattan, and I saw the power of media. We did the same thing for our local school board. There was corruption and cheating. We made a film about this. They threw the school bar out. Uh, had a, and for the first time, the things that we wanted to do were effective because we had cameras in our hands. What about the Stella Doro film? Stella Doro film, I, I'm still in touch with everybody from that. That's the other yeah. thing. I don't want to make you feel too good about yourself because no then I won't be able, I, 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 I don't have to worry about yeah, that. Yeah. But he did the closing of the Stelladoro factory that you pass by on the Major Deacon. Called uh, No Contract, No Cookies. Uh -huh. No Contract, No Cookies. It was lovely. It was good. It was about people whose livelihood and their whole American dream was making these little cookies. And it, well, they were biscuits. And they were going to be shipped to the South where they could get cheaper labor and no union. And John did this extraordinary film. Who would have made that film besides John? Who would have been able to get their trust? I, don't, I, I think it's an extraordinary ability, and I have learned something from you, uh, good and bad, mostly good. So I'm, I'm gonna say one or two things before we uh, get refreshments. Uh, first of all, um, next month when we show the film in Cuba. Yes, I'm every, so excited. Every, everybody's coming. Um, <laughs> the, the, we've, we just have, uh, we got an email, there are 50 people who are friends or associated with film that are gonna fill up the theater. It's gonna really be a, a wonderful event. Um, and so if anybody's in Cuba in December, uh, come to the screening, it's December 7th. Um, it's taking place during the Havana Film the Festival? Havana Film Festival, yeah, in the Rampa Theater. But um, everybody's talking about me. It's, we're gonna talk about Sheila for a second, sorry, Sheila, because I know you really like this. Um, I don't mind, actually. But, um, <laughs> It's, it's really, really good, helpful uh, to have such a strong partner in the films like Sheila. We walk in there and we think that we've got a great film and that there isn't a second that can't be cut and she beats the living daylights out of us. And the films it, it really, really get better because of that. Um, I'm not gonna name any names, but there's lots of good, great filmmakers who need somebody like Sheila as a partner because they get to the point where they're self-indulgent, they get to the point where they think their films never need to end, they get to the point where they like watching their own films and don't think about the audience. And Sheila's relentless in thinking about the audience and relentless in pushing you to make your film better. Uh, we come in and um, we, I, I, you don't know what happens after some of these meetings. We got so drunk once after uh, <laughs> a bag that we just didn't know what to do to recover. All right, you can do the film about the three families Thanks. in Cuba. <laughs> Oh no, she wasn't rolling. <laughs> uh, well, you, well, we can go upstairs and you can negotiate the contract uh, uh, oh, over thank drinks. You, I appreciate it. I just want to thank all our thank friends. So Larry wants to say something, but I want to thank Larry, all our friends Larry, from Larry, HBO. Larry, 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 here, here. Will all the HBO people get up next to Larry? Then Larry wants to say something. All the HBO friends here, come on. You know, nobody's getting up. Okay. No. On a world basis, you, you chose this on every TV set in every country. It can shake people up like nothing else can. Oh. You have done a magnificent service. Thank you, Larry Kramer. Uh, please uh, join us upstairs on the mezzanine uh, for reception. I want to thank you all for coming. Thanks especially to Sheila Evans and John Alpert. Thank you. Thank you to Doc NYC. Thank you, appreciate it.